Sometimes I forget that the most important things I have learned in my seven years of the Unitarian Universalist ministry comes down to what I predicted I needed to learn six weeks into the ministry of my first congregation, that our mistakes are not the most important part of us, that kindness and compassion matter more than anything, just as our youth choir sang to us this morning. So basically, everything that I have learned comes down to love, because love covers the vast array of mistakes, missteps, and missed opportunities. Love allows for healing, for transformation. Love allows for grace to rush in and carry us through, which is the stuff of which our work is made. A reminder of this lesson of love came to me metaphorically in the shape of an apple. A brown bag of apples actually left on my desk in my office during my time in Cohasset. No note. And these apples were different. They were odd-shaped with indents and brown blemishes and soft spots. And it had been so long since I had seen an apple without that quality approved sticker, polished and perfect, that I wondered if these apples were actually edible. Well, the next morning, I learned they were from a tree in the yard of Martha, an elderly woman in the congregation who had just lost her husband, Arna. A tree I had stood under the day I said goodbye to him. And I remember how during that visit, Martha's face lit up as she pointed to the apples just then beginning to ripen. I looked again at the apples on my desk, and they suddenly looked different. Not more round or less blemished, but more nourishing. Arna was Norwegian, and as a teenager, he and his brother and father were active in the resistance movement against the Nazis. At the age of 16, his father and brother were imprisoned, and with Arna's mother dead, Arna was left alone to fend for himself for two years. He continued his resistance by delivering illegal newspapers. He was reunited with his father and his brother, and they fled to Sweden and made it to this country, but he carried this experience into his adult life, valuing the democratic process and participating in local politics, a passion he shared with Martha, who is still a select woman well into her 90s. So looking at the apples, I knew they were truly perfect in the way the gospel was written, made full and ripe by the lives and love of Martha and Arna. Apples that I had dismissed and this metaphor was not lost on me, that this is how perfection works in people, too. How we do everything to look perfect, live perfectly, to avoid judgment. And how when we think we fail, we perceive ourselves as less worthy. So I know I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Anybody else claim that today? In grade school, I worked hard for those check pluses, smile, check plus polite, check plus, gets along with others, check plus. And as an adult, I'm a pleaser to anything to avoid judgment because perfectionism at its core is about approval. And because we can't control people's perceptions, it is an unattainable goal and illusion. Now, our Unitarian forebears may be responsible a little bit for our illusion of perfectionism. In the mid-19th century, Unitarian minister James Freeman Clark proclaimed the five points of the Unitarian faith. The last two of these five points were salvation by character and the progress of mankind onward and upward forever. In other words, our very salvation 
depends on the constant improvement of our character. And it's not only our salvation that is at stake, because our individual progress contributes to the progress of all mankind, or lack thereof. Just a little bit of pressure. So, but taken in a historical context, these points were, of course, radical and empowering. It matters what we do. We have the capacity to impact our own eternal destiny. God's mercy is not arbitrary. But the message today of onward and upward forever, one that my father held dear, is a grueling one to try to live out because, in truth, we do have limits and limitations of all kinds. So accepting our limitations with compassion may be our more challenging struggle because where perfection exists, shame is always lurking. Brene Brown, author of The Gift of, Her of Perfection, shares this story about perfection and shame. She writes, a couple of years ago, Stephen and I went to a dinner party of an acquaintance house. These were our new fancy friends, and I was really anxious to make a good impression. When we got there, they offered us an appetizer, a big silver bowl of beans. When I first saw them, I thought they were beans that needed to be shucked for dinner. So when they offered them to us as an appetizer, I'm sure I looked shocked. I said, really? What is it? Well, I'll never forget the look on their faces. They were absolutely floored. What do you mean, what is it? Well, I immediately felt this warm wave of shame, and I apologetically asked, are they beans? And the host replied, of course, it's edamame. Don't tell me you've never heard of edamame. Don't you eat sushi? sushi? Then, as if it were both unbelievable and fascinating, she started turning to the other guests and announcing, they've never had edamame. Can you believe it? Well, I desperately, says Brene Brown, wanted to turn right around and go home. I was filled with shame. So she goes on. This is actually a three-part story. She goes on, a couple weeks later, I was in my office working and eating some beans. I ended up really loving edamame. And a student knocked on the door, she was a professor, and asked if she could come in to talk to me about a paper. I'm not sure why this student pushed my buttons, but she did. It was probably because she reminded me of myself when I was in my late 20s, smart, but at sometimes painfully insecure and trying harder than necessary. She looked at my bag of beans and said, what are those? Well, in that split second, I felt that dinner party shame all over again. And what must have been an attempt to shift my shame by putting some of it on her, I said, edamame, of course, haven't you had them? And she looked embarrassed. No, I don't think so. Are they any good? And then, in a very Joan Crawford way, I said, I can't believe you haven't tried them. They're super fit food. They're fabulous. So Brene goes on to say, by the time that student left my office, I was numb. I couldn't believe it. Why had I done that? I had no steak in soybeans. Then it hit me. Not knowing about Japanese food is a culture and class issue. And for me, class was a trigger of shame. <coughs> Sorry, I have a cold. Well, a few months later, this is the last part of the story, Brene's good friend from her working class childhood came home for a visit. And Brene chose this time to demystify knowledge and heal her shame. She said, hey, I'm going to make some edamame. Have you tried it? And when her friend said, no, what is it? Brene smiled. I think it's Japanese for soybean. You boil them and sprinkle with salt, and they're really good. I just had them for the first time a few weeks ago. End of story. So as you can see, shame has a way 
of repeating itself unless you break the cycle, like Brene did with her friend. After seven years of research, Brene figured out we have four steps we can take to become shame resilient and become practically and beautifully imperfect. First, she says, we have to figure out our shame triggers. Shame happens when you're assigned an unwanted identity. Figure out what your ideal identities are by finishing this sentence. I want to be perceived as, how would you fill in that blank? You can say it out loud, you can say it to yourself. I want to be perceived as, and for me, smart, fair, principled comes to mind. Then, figure out your unwanted identities by finishing this sentence. I don't want to be perceived as, fill in the blank, for me, uneducated, maybe not relevant. And for clues, you can turn, tune into your body. When does your face feel flushed, and your stomach tighten? Listen to your mind spinning the same conversation over and over. 90% of us experience some shame around our body images. Other biggies are mothering, addiction, and affairs. The second step is to zoom out and make a connection between your experience with a larger societal, social system. For Jillian, a 40-year-old mom, her ideal identities were thin, sexy, and confident. Her unwanted identities were tired, old, and frumpy. Her kids treated her like she was old and frumpy. So when they did, she got upset just to deflect her shame. So to become shame resilient, Jillian did some research on media messages about body images. She found that 80% of 10-year-olds have already dieted once because they feel they are unattractive. And among women over 18 years of age, 80% who look in the mirror are unhappy with what they see. So Jillian decided to support organizations working for healthy body imaging for women and girls. She let go of those ideal identities, and now she says to her friends and to her family, this is what 40 looks like. And for me, this is what 56 looks like. So the third step is to reach out and talk about your shame. Stop giving it the secrecy it craves. Create your networks. Sometimes it takes a few strikeouts before you find the right people. You might even get what Brene calls a vulnerability hangover. When you feel like you've actually thrown up vulnerability on someone and you can't believe you actually put those words into air. Have you ever had that experience? Like you go home and you say, I can't believe I told that person that. So it takes courage to receive someone's shame when our first instinct might be to run. So empathy is essential. And the fourth step is to create shame resilience by talking openly about the experience of shame with those who trigger you especially ask for what you need. Use the language of growth. I'd like to get better at. I'd like to improve at. So four steps, knowing your shame triggers, connecting your experience to larger systems, reaching out and using the language of growth. Maybe our religious ancestors were right about this idea of perfection as growth. We just need to add the kindness and compassion to help us get us where we need to go. And all this means giving voice to love. Brene suggests that before you write or speak or do anything, ask yourself, is this coming from a place of love? The answer is often in your body. If you are tense, then probably no. If your face is relaxed, then probably yes. So as we go forward this week and we celebrate Valentine's Day, I hope you choose to be practically imperfect, being kind to yourself and others, and letting love carry you through the vast array of mistakes, missteps, and missed opportunities. Love for the healing, love for transformation, love for the grace to rush in and carry us through, which is the stuff of which our work is made. Love for what makes us ripe for the giving. Love for what makes us human. 
Amen and blessed be.